You might be here because you've seen one of these before, which I like to call the black background white text math genre, type videos, type beats. And these are all great videos that I recommend watching before you watch me. But either way, you might have thought about different counting systems before, whether it's because of finger counting, or dozens and grosses, or computer science, or long counts, or French, or who knows what. And you might feel that even if some math becomes easier and some harder when you change numeral bases, it all feels pretty familiar in the end. Which is to be expected, since we almost always talk about standard positional numeral systems. Whether or not you're into this kind of stuff or not, let's do a quick review of what those are. The basic premise of a base is that for base n, we have n digits starting from zero. When we represent an integer, each position represents a power of n, starting from n to the zero, or in other words, one. When people talk about alternative ways to count, you'll often hear about base 12, base 8, base 16, base 6, base 20. What most favorites share in common is being even, so divisible by 2, and either being a power of 2 or just having lots of factors. In the case of base 6, the major advantage is that it has the factors 2 and 3, the two smallest primes, which makes a nice combo. But 6 is also right next to 5 and 7, which makes representing the first 12 positive integers and their fractions really easy. But let's go back to that word even. Intuitively, it makes sense because every even number is divisible by 2, so there's a free factor right there. I mean, who the hell wants to use an odd number like 7, am I right, guys? And it's important to be able to divide things by 2. I mean, 2 is the smallest integer greater than 1, which makes it kind of a big deal. Building on this, you might take a brave step and think, what if I try base 2? And finally, you start feeling like things are getting different. Arithmetic is nothing when you use binary. The simplicity makes it so much easier to avoid errors, and you can even perform operations like square roots manually without taking 5 hours. That's crazy! Wait, oh wow, that's a thousand? That's five thousand? Okay, yes, even if binary representation is really efficient, unfortunately we have eyeballs, and reading comprehension for this is really bad. I mean, even if you divide it into chunks, or use simpler characters, even if we kept this uniformly divided so we had a standard to jump to for measuring the magnitude of numbers visually, they just never look very distinct. If you try saving space and just drawing lines, try writing this on paper. Seriously, this is hard to line up without making mistakes. And if you do the cursive style, it's impossible to read. While I'm sure someone could come up with a really creative orthographic solution to this, the solution most of us will jump to is we should compress this into base 8 or base 16 or something, and now you aren't even using binary anymore. And yes, this is still terrible, even if you lose some resolution and do like exponentiation or something. By the way, the logarithmic naming scheme is ridiculous, not just if you visualize it, but okay, less names does not equal good, alright? Like, each of these names contains so much less information about the number than downright turning this into chunks like we do in decimals, seriously, what the f- Anyways, enough of that. At this point, it may seem that these are the kinds of options you have. Tiny base, fun size base, medium base, big base. But what if I told you there was another way? Let's bring in the number line. Here are the integers base 2 uses in base 4, in base 6, decimal, hexadecimal, notice something? They're all on this side of the number line, which is like, well duh, if we want to represent negative numbers we just flip this over with a negative sign. Why use negative numbers when you can just focus on one side? That'd be really weird and- wait, we can use negative numbers? Okay, so despite the name of the video, I'm not nearly as formal as the people who made those other videos. I'm just going to be talking about my experience obsessively practicing this. I'll probably miss the best stuff that one dude from Slovenia has been studying for decades. Hopefully he leaves a comment with more facts about the base. I'm not actually trying to claim this is the best way to count, despite it being my personal favorite. I'm more interested in other things. Oh, and I hope you don't think I'm just being contrarian for this, but I'm going to set the background to gray. No, it isn't a bit. I use this shade for everything I do. It's easier on my eyes. If you hate it, uh, sorry? Anyways, let's get to it. So if we add negative integers into our set of digits, we've technically entered the realm of non-standard positional numeral systems. This includes weirdos like factoradic and p-adic numbers, but also a group known as the balanced bases. These are all bases which are symmetric about zero. They work the same as a normal base, each position represents a power of the base, but you can also choose to make a digit negative and subtract it from the total of the number you're building. This immediately seems pretty convoluted, like you have to do computation in your head just to read a number, but we'll get to that. You might notice that in order to be symmetric, we have to use an odd number of digits, and therefore an odd base. And yeah, there is a reason odd numbers seem gross. Odd numbers have fewer factors, and all prime numbers are odd. 
Being a Saximal fan before I was enlightened, I figured this was going to be a rough trip for me. But I had a few things to focus on. I won't explain exactly why, because there isn't any real reason, but my favorite numbers are 3, 4, 6, 9, and 13. Along with some squares like 121 and 144 for some reason. Specifically, 4 and 9 needed to be treated well for me to be sold. Mainly though, my whole goal was to find a way to simplify arithmetic while still being as human-friendly as possible. About 90% of the arithmetic I do always has an error. So with that in mind, I began my search. The obvious next step from binary would be balanced ternary, or trinary, or whatever you call it. I sometimes imagine this base as the underappreciated veiny brain genius brother of binary, not to flatter it too much, but since the name is absolutely absurd when you have to say it a hundred times, I'm just going to call it tribalanced, or trip for short. In trip, our set of digits is simply negative 1, 0, and 1. This negative 1 digit has been written many ways historically, but it's usually represented as a 1 with an overbar or a T, which is much nicer. So let's try it out a bit. Say we want to write the number 2. Well, we don't have a digit 2, but we have the 3 spot and a 1 spot. So you write it as 3 minus 1. Okay, 8 is 9 minus 1. 6 is 9 minus 3. 15 is 27 minus 9 minus 3. And negative 15 is this just flipped. Interesting. Incrementing by 1 looks familiar. The only difference is that we set all the previous digits to t instead of 0 when we move to the next position. Adding numbers is easy. 1 plus 1 is 2, negative 1 plus negative 1 is negative 2, and 1 minus 1 is 0. The carryover rate is lower than binary, since 1s and negative 1s regularly cancel each other out. Subtraction is just addition, except one of the numbers has its digits flipped. This is really nice because you never ever have to keep track of reverse carries ever again. Personally, I also find it a little easier to track negative numbers, since negatives have a different leading digit. Multiplication is straightforward. You either keep your number the same, invert it, or set zero and move to the next digit. But then, um, how does division work? What about when there are a lot of digits to carry, and how am I supposed to read this again? Uh, we'll get back to the math later. Before we start digging into what we'll need to do to make this work, let's talk about what makes trip an appealing choice in the first place. Why is binary so widely used even in a decimal world? Binary has a strong naturalistic argument, since powers of 2 are incredibly common in nature. 2 is the lowest integer greater than 1 after all, and all even numbers share some of that power. And I mean, it's obviously very important to be able to just divide things in half. For human and computer logic, you can assign true or false states to 1 and 0, which are obviously the only two logic states that exist. Most importantly for the computer industry, and therefore us chronically online people, binary has a low radix economy, which I can briefly describe as the efficiency of its representation of numbers relative to the number of digits used. Not the rigorous definition, but if you've never heard of it before, that should give you an idea of what it's measuring. It's really important for computers because circuits need to be as simple as possible to make them practical to manufacture. Transistors, a fundamental building block of a computer, differentiate voltage states to determine what their value is. And the easiest, least error-prone approach is to just differentiate two voltage states, boom. And the prominence of binary compressions like hexadecimal in our lives logically follows. But here's an interesting question. What base has the lowest radix economy? It's actually base E, which if you know what Euler's number is like, might not be too shocking. But here's the thing. Which integer is closer to E? 2 or 3? That's right, trinary actually has the lowest radix economy of all integer bases. Then, why don't we use it in computers? Well, trinary requires transistors which can detect three voltage states while also avoiding errors, which is more difficult to manufacture and no one is making those en masse. The circuitry is also more complicated, but here's the thing. Trinary computers have literally been made before. The Soviet Union made trinary computers in the 70s, but eventually joined the binary trend anyways because, well, ironically, the Soviet Union was not very good at maintaining the independence of their industries. Damn shame, I tell you what. Thankfully, people have made emulators of trinary computers, and some people out there retain the esoteric knowledge to assemble these things, so uh, look them up if you have time. But there is one thing about electronics I'd like to mention. Have you ever heard of two's complement? Well, first, ask this question. How do you write a negative number on a binary computer? There is no negative sign to use because you only have ones and zeros, so what do you do? Well, you can make one bit into a sign bit, if it's off its positive on its negative. But what about when you need to actually add numbers? Well, that's where the complement part of the name comes in. 
You make it so that a string of 1s is negative 0, naturally, and then make the negative numbers match the inverse of the positive, and uh, yeah. This can cause overflow errors on computers and is a little annoying to account for. In trinary, there's the trinary system, where you add numbers. There's something even more interesting about trinary computation, though. Photonic computing. You know how waves interfere with each other when a hill meets a trough? Light waves with different phases can do the same thing. And, well, you can use it to do math. No electronic intermediates at all, just light. For example, let's say you have a slot for light to pass through here, and two light waves meeting here. If they interfere, you get this ring with an empty center giving you darkness, or a zero. Even more cool though, light can be rotated. Okay, well not literally rotated, go ask someone else about that. But light can be polarized. Light that's polarized vertically and horizontally might be used to represent, say, one and negative one. The nature of light, as far as I'm concerned, is meant for trinary. Oh yeah, remember that sarcastic comment about Boolean logic earlier? Yeah, there actually doesn't have to just be true or false. In trip, you can have true, false, and unknown. This is awesome to me for so many reasons, and it is much easier to implement shade of gray logic in trip than binary. Wow, that's so meta! There is one thing that's hard to argue with, though. The naturalistic argument. Twos and halves are really important, both in daily life and computers. Lots of things operate in pairs. So, what argument can be made for an odd-numbered base? Well, we'll address the number two later, but trip has its own trick up its sleeve. Where two is the lowest integer greater than one, trip is the smallest useful integer range. What exactly do I mean by that? Notice how in trip, we have zero surrounded by t and one. We can define a range between t and 1, where we can differentiate integers greater than, less than, or within this range. The in-between part is really important. This zone here has the highest resolution you could have for an integer range, only one possible value. Now you may be saying, so not what the heck, you can literally do greater or less than statements in any base, what are you talking about? That's true, but notice how it's built into the digits themselves. Not only do we have a range of 1, but we have a negative digit as well, making the less than statement a lot more literal. To illustrate how this is actually helpful, let's look at some counting puzzles. Using a balance and a set of standard weights, which are powers of 3, you can determine the value of any unknown weight and express it in trip. Say you have a weight that's 42 schlugels, and we have these weights up to 81 schlugels. Here is how you could figure out that your weight is 42 schlugels, and here is how you write 42 in trip. In the same vein, a currency based on powers of 3 could do exact change for any transaction. That last one is getting more interesting, since it actually could have some applications in things like Bitcoin. But we don't care about scams or counting puzzles, we want real applications. Wait, isn't counting what we're improving on? This is where I introduce Thomas Fowler, my personal pick for the Leibniz of Balanced Ternary. Not only is he cooler because he's a self-educated working man and is not my second least favorite theologian, he also used Trip to solve an accounting problem. He was calculating financial dues in the times of pre-decimal British currency, which if I remember correctly went something like 4 farthings to a penny, 12 pence to a shilling, and 20 shillings to a pound. Ugh, it gives me chills. When calculating fair dues for multiple partners, he had to perform operations on absurd decimal numbers. When he converted those numbers to trip, he dramatically reduced the amount of multiplication and division he needed to do by an order of magnitude. Multiply that by how much simpler arithmetic is in trip, and it's a pretty damn good deal for taking the time to convert all those numbers. I won't describe exactly how it reduced the amount of multiplication and division, but uh, go to this website, or click on the first link in the description to read more about the guy, or just, you know, Use your fat sausage fingers to type Thomas Fowler and look him up. Lots of cool things hidden all over the place. He also made a working ternary multiplication machine in the 1840s with nothing but pure woodworking skills. Absolute baller. If that doesn't prove how cool this base is, I don't know what will. By this point, it seems like trinary meets all the same criteria for being important that binary meets today, and I am not at all being thorough. It even has practical applications that make binary look second best. Things for computers and things that might actually come in handy in normal life. But all this is just a preamble for why mathematically you would ever want to count like this. Now we can get back to the how. When we left off, all we saw was that addition and multiplication were easy and subtraction was basically addition. We have a lot more problems to address though. First of all, we should look at readability. It's kind of hard to do math if you can't read. 
ones and t's aren't bad, but they're designed for two completely unrelated systems. Is there a better way to write these? Well, thinking back to photonic computers, we can represent these digits with curves perpendicular to each other. The simplest way to do that on paper would be with an n and a c shape. Let's say n is positive and c is negative. This is okay, but they can blend in with zero depending on how you write them. Let's add a line to both of these to get new shapes, which you might describe as looking like H and Tau. And because this has always bugged me, these characters will be the exact same size, everything fitting into the same square box. Alright, now let's look at it in my handwriting. Okay, this is epic. Here's the thing though, 3 is a really small number. In fact, we don't even have a digit for 2, we literally have 1. So this brings up the question, how do we speak this? Having a way to compress these numbers in your head helps legibility just as much as while reading them. Well, it makes sense since this is base 3 to divide these into groups of 3. If we treat a group of 3 as an individual number, we get 13 possible positive numbers. And we don't need special names for the negatives. 13 seems like an absolutely disgusting number for a base to be involving itself with since it's a prime, but it really doesn't cause any cognitive issues that I'm aware of, pending my brain scan. Now, there's almost certainly a way to make this fit English speech, since we only need names for the different intervals, analogous to thousands, millions, and billions, and a fast way to say numbers like negative 13. For this number, I highly doubt you want to say something like 11 somethings minus 12 somethings plus 4. It's just dumb. Not like that isn't technically what we'll be doing anyways, but, you know. So I cheated a bit. Well, I didn't cheat. This was my intention from the start. But I have an entirely different way of saying these numbers that's more fitting for their size and rhythm. Yep, we are abandoning English. Don't follow in my footsteps on this one, since I'm constantly changing things, but take this as a demo of the idea. Let's count from 1 to 13. An, dva, de, ak, fi, sech, wen, het, non, yen, fir, tjak, as. A negative number is just one of these with meh added at the end. Now let's look at the intervals. 27 of something should be simple, like saying bushel or bunch. So I might choose but, just because it sounds like a lot or lot. I also have names for these two, but I won't mention them. 729 of something is pretty large, but still the kind of group you might talk about for shipping merchandise as a small business or groups of something small. This is a rot. After that, we have a huge jump to 19,683. This is where standardized names begin, and they are loosely derived from the names of our first 13 numbers. Nebel, Dvebel, Diebel, and Kebel. Before that one dude shows up, these are not supposed to be Ogonex, so shh. Let's take a large number and see how it performs. 1 billion is a pretty awkward number, so let's try that one. Sounds snappy, but problem, it's 20 digits long. There's nothing we can do to shorten it without losing resolution or compressing it into balanced non aries so game over guys. It was fun, but it's time to give up. Wait, remember, we are humans, I think. Okay, we aren't computers, so reading isn't just scanning the entire number. A glance is important too, so what can we do to make you immediately see this and think, oh yeah, that's a kebel, while still being able to read the whole number? We can start stacking these digits. Yeah, sounds pretty ooga booga, but hear me out. I'm going to do this in rows instead of columns for, uh, reasons. But let's take each of these intervals and turn them into their own row. This reads from left to right, bottom to top. Now, let's add dots on every other column. Now here is a pat. Rot, nebel, dvebel, tiebel, kebel. Alright, this is great, but the digits are still there. Well, we can at least make these look a little more distinct by adding some ligatures. Ligatures are special characters used when a combination of two or more characters is present. Personally, I just combine repeating numbers and don't really have anything for more mixed numbers like this one. The only one I have a major problem with is this one, since it can be hard to line up the bumps sometimes, but eh, I've had some practice with it at this point. So now that we can read, we should probably figure out arithmetic, you know, the counting part. For arithmetic, there are tricks you can do with the rows I showed, but it takes more practice than learning and everyone does math differently in their head. So we'll just use single digits. As far as any of these operations are concerned, there isn't much to be done about long numbers, but if you're adding up lots of numbers, it's simple to do them all at once. To make sure you can double check yourself, you can write these little commas to show that this carry comes from this column. To give a sense of scale, the answer here is in the negative ten thousands. 
It does obviously take a fair amount of space to write it out, but that's the trade-off. Multiplication is just this kind of addition with more zeros, so the same skills apply there. Now there are three operations left. Division, square root, and cube root. All three of these operations are more complicated than their binary counterparts, and this is where Trip really reveals its character. In decimal division, you find the smallest partial dividend that you can subtract from with a multiple of your divisor. Trip division is slightly different. Let's take 4 divided by 2. If the absolute value of the partial dividend is greater than the absolute value of half your divisor, set t or 1. If it is less, set 0. In defiance of the decimal instincts you might have, you actually subtract 2 from 1 before moving to the next digit. Otherwise, this is exactly the same as normal long division. In fact, a little simpler. You don't even have to guess the correct value to multiply your divisor by. The quotient is determined entirely by where the value falls on this number line. In the square root operation, you split your dividend into pairs starting from the radix point. You subtract the square of your first answer digit from the first partial dividend, meaning it can only be 1 or 2. If this dividend is 1 or 2, it's 1, 3 or 4, it's 2. You then add the next pair onto the partial dividend and set your next divisor to your partial quotient times 6 plus x times x. You will subtract this divisor from your partial dividend. Your answer for x will be the answer for the next digit of your partial quotient. Add the next pair to the partial remainder and repeat. Cube roots begin with splitting the number into trios, setting the first quotient digit so that you can subtract the quotient cubed from the partial dividend so it can either be 1, 2, or 3, and then adding the next trio to the dividend and subtracting 9 times the partial quotient. You then set the next divisor to 27 times the partial partial quotient squared plus x times x. x works the same as last time, but now after this step, you subtract 9 times your new quotient as well and repeat. With all of these operations, you can tell what your answer for the next quotient digit is by seeing if the value of your partial dividend is less than half your divisor, greater than half or smaller in absolute value. Okay, that was a lot. Let's break that down a bit. The rhythm of long division feels different, but once you have some practice, it's alright. You learn to go with the flow, and things just fall into place. The annoying part is calculating half your divisor, but you only need to do this once. Despite 2 seeming like the anti-good number for base 3, you'll notice easy patterns. For example, 1s followed by zeros set to t, 4s sometimes become negative 2s, stuff like that. And hey, it's nice to be able to do roots at all, even if they are kinda eh. Realistically speaking, 99% of people never manually do roots ever in decimal, and in this case, long division is much simpler. You also kind of get a natural feel when you need to set zero, but that isn't always reliable. Overall though, I'd say that square roots are a completely doable operation for most numbers, and the only thing I'd say is definitely pushing it is cube roots. I mean, obviously, what the f- uh. There is actually another bonus operation. Logarithms. Where roots care about this variable, logarithms care about this part. Unfortunately, I haven't found any magic trick for logarithms yet. I feel like there could be one with the comparative power of trinary. Only way I know how to do this is the same as always. Guess, or if you're a computer, do the power series. But here's the thing about guessing. In order to guess effectively, you need to obtain some information from the representation of the number itself. For example, I know this number is related to 5, this is even and a power of 2, this looks prime, this looks like 3 times 72. Some of these could be recognized by years of memorizing an informal shorthand, but fundamentally they are all related to divisibility tests. If you've seen the binary video I mentioned, you might remember how they pointed out that you can recognize motifs in a binary number that look like your divisor, so you can divide visually. This also applies to decimal sometimes. 216 is obviously 72 times 3 because both of the numbers making up 216 are multiples of 3. This is just more obvious for small bases because there are fewer multiples of anything. You only have 2 or 3 digits. In the case of trip, it's a little more compressed, for the obvious reason that this number is bigger than this one, but also because we see symmetrical negatives. This number is obviously divisible by 5, and this one is obviously divisible by 7. Could you recognize that 1708 was divisible by 7? 5299? In trip, 216 looks exactly like 8 times 27. Most numbers aren't this easy though. Here are some powers of 2. Now, this comparison isn't always fair, since a lot of these are built into our memory by this point, but there is a real problem here. Patterns are not always obvious in trinary. There are plenty that are obvious that you couldn't see in any other base, but like switching to any other base, there are a lot of tests that we've lost. It wouldn't be too different from how we already do things to just start remembering these with practice, and I gotta say, it hasn't been half bad. If you have the ability to remember smaller patterns, like for example, you can probably see how 4 times 4 leads to 16. Here is 36 in trip. 
could you recognize it was 6 squared? And there are many more simple multiplications you can spot in larger numbers to divide them, or at least estimate what your result will be. But it would be nice to supplement this with something more reliable, at least to get something worth it for our troubles. That's where the universal divisibility test comes in. Similar to their debut in the binary video, magic sequences can be used to test divisibility in trip. If you don't know what they are, a magic sequence can be generated for any number following these simple rules. For base n starting with 1, multiply 1 by n repeatedly. To get the magic sequence for a number x, subtract x or a multiple of x from the number in your sequence every time it grows larger than x. This operation is written as mod x. Do this until it loops back to 1. Let's find the magic sequence for 7. First we start with 1 and keep multiplying by 3. When we reach any number larger than 7, we subtract 7 or a multiple of 7 from the number and continue multiplying by 3. Here, the sequence goes 1, 3, 2, 6, 4, 5, 1. If we take a number like 343 and starting from the least significant digit, add the sequence as if it was being multiplied by each of these digits, we get 14. If the result is any number divisible by our magic sequence number, or 0, our original query is also divisible by that number. This is nice to have, but it's obviously not as desirable as just instantly seeing factors, but this does allow you to be more rigorous and detect factors that might take you a longer time to guess manually. While some numbers get lucky with their sequences, 10 and 20 only have three unique entries. This isn't always great for larger numbers. There are some special cases for the divisibility test. The main one that needs mentioning is the sequence for two. It's just repeating once. And you can tell if your trip number is even if its digits add to an even number. This is not the best for large numbers, but it's not horrible in my opinion. There is one thing missing here though. You can also use the magic sequence to derive Let's take the binary magic sequence for 3, 1, 2, 1. For each pair with a rise in value, we write 0, and for each decrease we write 1. Because this sequence loops this 0 and 1 loop, and conveniently if you put this behind a radix point, you just expressed 1 third in binary. What's actually happening behind the scenes can be generalized to any base. The reason the decrease is a 1 is because it involves us subtracting 1 times 2. Whatever the multiplicand is in the mod operation is our digit for the ratio. For proving this, I gotta give my honest thanks to the binary dork Lucila. Lucia? Lucila? Something like that. Genuinely, they documented their work very well, and they included proofs for all of this in their footnotes. Side note, I almost figured this all out on my own, and I was like one step away before I broke down and checked if they actually showed their work, and they did. Now, let's take the magic sequence shared by 4 and 8, which is 1, 3, 1. With 8, there is only one subtraction here, 1 times 8, so this is just a 1 and a 0 here. For 4, you need to use 2 times 4 to subtract back below 4, so this is 2. The only two values you will ever see are 1 or 2. Problem with this being a bound space though, we have a result which is represented by two digits, so we actually have to do carries here. While the extra step of carrying the 1 seems like a hassle, you do recognize patterns of 1 and 2 multiplicands after a couple of times doing this, and you don't really have a problem. As a tribute, here is the sequence for 19, an introspective ratio that almost carried me to the finish line, but yeah, yet 19 is a gross number. Now, can we recognize multiples of fractions? First, let's see what all the fractions look like. Ew, am I right? Notice how our magic sequence for 2 shows up in the half fraction, and sure, it's easy to remember a recurring 1 for a half, but really? Doesn't look very appealing, right? Well, there are two ways to write 1 half. 0.1 recurring, or 1 point negative 1 recurring. This is important because it implies all fractions above a half are 1 minus something. This symmetry reduces the number of unique digit sequences you have to remember for multiples of fractions since you can just invert them. It also helps if you're using those ligatures I mentioned earlier since they make clusters more clear. Regardless, these seem a bit long to be catching while you're doing regular math. In decimal, it's simple to recognize a fourth, sixth, eighth, or ninth of something. Trip fractions look unfamiliar, but I'll show you that it's easy to identify these in the wild as well. A fourth is a good demonstration. One fourth looks like two repeating, and two fourths looks exactly as you'd expect. Three fourths just looks like the inverse of one fourth intuitively following what I said earlier about halves. One fifth and two fifths can be easily remembered, but also it's easy to understand how this is just this times two. Three fifths is the inverse of two fifths. Four fifths is the inverse of one fifth. It's not hard to remember 0.2 through 0.8 either, but again, I think recognizing inverted digits requires less memory since you can derive them at will. Here's an eighth, three eighths, 7 eighths, 1 7th, 2 7 3 7 4 7 
But what about calculating these fractions? Well, the magic sequence doesn't only need to start at 1. You can start the magic sequence at any value, so if you want to know what 2 sevenths is, start the magic sequence for 7 at 2. Bobby, why the hell else do you think I'd sell propane, not ethane, you dumbass? Well, let's take a chicken. This is my really cool drawing of a chicken. Or possibly a cock, I can't quite tell. Now, when you count in your head, you usually take large groups and divide them into more digestible chunks. For me, the highest I can go is about 5, so let's say there are 7 chickens. When you quickly count these within a second or two, I would divide this into 3 and 4 chickens and get my answer. Here's the thing though, if you're counting in balanced trinary, specifically using the language I described earlier, once you exceed 13, all of a sudden you jump to including a lack of chickens while counting in your head. This isn't really a problem for incremental counting, but for big groups you might be worried that you'll get confused and frustrated doing that. However, to address your concern, discerning viewer, I assert to you that it is a simple matter. Let's say you've counted Depot Venme chickens so far. Wow, you're good. And you're gonna add Fjord more. Well, what's 11 minus 7? Oh, wait, that was nitpicking. Okay, the real problem, the main problem with all of this negative number nonsense, is that it isn't super intuitive to remember the addition table of the first 13 numbers verbally. Ven plus Ven is Patasme, As plus As is Patanme. Once you've remembered these, you don't even need to imagine the trios of digits in your head to add and subtract things, but that's just it. A 13 by 13 addition table, and you might learn a multiplication table like that as well. That, and you have to remember more complicated carries, seems pretty lame. I mean, it's nice you could probably do this on paper, but what about in the field? All I can really say for this right now is that while I can't explain how or why I prefer it, this also is something that just comes with practice. Maybe in the future I'll come back to this with some wise wisdoms, but for now, this video has already stolen away too much of my time. So, let's look at what the number 3 does right for counting. In any base, the most distinct numbers, the easiest to do math with, and the ones we care the most about are the multiples of the base. Zeros are very, very cozy after all. So it makes sense that in everything we do, the metric system, finance, counting literally anything, we use tens because we work in decimal. But let's actually visually look at powers of ten. Here is one thing, ten things, a hundred things, a thousand things, ten thousand things, a hundred thousand things. Did you lose track there? Could you really identify or differentiate many of those numbers in a random context all on your own? This is my main gripe with base ten. It's just not at a human scale. Sure, we have 10 fingers, but is 10 fingers any more natural than having 8 or 2? This is also why the metric system annoys me a little. Sure, the imperial system is stupid, but is measuring a cup of butter really stupider than measuring 113.4 fucking grams? It's a fucking kitchen, not a goddamn lab. Not all butter is the same density anyway! And, I mean, I love having a measuring system based on universal physical constants. In fact, that's the best you could ask for. But surely we can have that AND adjust it so that it's actually a little human friendly? This can be done in base 10, but I think if I were to redo the entire thing anyways, I'd do it in base 3. For now, let's focus on the object counting problem. This is something of an assertion, sources me, but when I chose to count with base 3, it was partially based on the following hypothesis. Human and or animal minds are meant to count in powers of three. The reasoning is straightforward. You need to count things. The things that are really important to count include threats or quantity of food. There isn't much point in counting exactly since what's important is getting an immediate estimate as quickly as possible, so instead you count logarithmically. For example, the difference between one or two lions surrounding you is just as large as the difference between 92 or 93 lions surrounding you, but the relative difference between one and two lions is much greater. Furthermore, I'm pretty sure that the most distinguishable groups of things happen to be in powers of 3, like 9 versus 27 or 27 versus 81. So before I show you the powers of 3, let's look at some other bases and see how their powers compare. Here's 6, 36, 216, 1,296, 7,776. Let's look at binary now. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. This is pretty darn good. Now let's look at 3, 9, 27, 81, 243, 729. This is my personal opinion, but this one is obviously my favorite. Regardless what your exact personal opinion is though, I think you can see what I mean when I say these smaller bases have more distinguishable powers. Logarithmic counting is a very real thing. Powers of 3 are natural, and balanced ternary, symmetrical, and it can work for humans. Okay, great, let's assume you agree with all that. 
But as fun as playing the trinary is, can you use it in a decimal world? Consider most every number you come across is going to be in decimal, so if you want to live the tri life, you gotta convert all those numbers. Because trip is awesome, converting numbers is pretty easy. Let's take 48. Let's make two columns, one called divisor and the other remainder. 3 goes into 48 16 times, so we write 16 here and a 0 here, because there's no remainder. Now the closest we can get to 16 is 15, so we write 5 in the divisor column and a remainder of 1. 2 times 3 is 6, so we write 2 here and a negative 1 here. 1 times 3 is 3 with a remainder of negative 1. And finally, 0 times 3 with a remainder of 1. From least to most significant digit, you just wrote 48 in balanced ternary. You can also convert small numbers in your head. For example, it's obvious that 72 is 81 minus 9, or that 40 is 27 plus 13. In fact, remembering repeating ones or negative ones, or just remembering the powers of 3, is a great way to grasp the range of each of these positions and just convert things. Honestly, you learned these on accident. I had no plan to memorize these, I just did after a day or two before I realized it was useful. In the end, this is all really stupid if you think about it, but I love it a lot, and I plan to continue going down this path as long as I can. And to you who have your own favorite base, whether it's funny seximal or old-fashioned dozenal or bitwise binary or ancient vigesimal or I don't fucking know, go be a nerd, you nerd. Stupid, dumb, idiot nerd. To close the curtain, here is my favorite quote from my favorite accountant. This is a real recording of him speaking. I often reflect that had the ternary instead of the denary notation been adopted in the infancy of society, machines something like the present would long ere this have been common, as the transition from mental to mechanical calculation would have been so very obvious and simple. I said this. Wow, this guy should come to my schoolhouse.